Last February, film director Roman Polanski fled Los Angeles for Paris, the night before he was to be sentenced for having had unlawful sexual intercourse with a 13-year-old girl. He had given her champagne and a quaalude during their encounter. Roman Polanski, the man who directed Jack Nicholson in Chinatown and Mia Farrow in Rosemary's Baby, has led a life as bizarre as the plots of some of his films. Now a fugitive from justice, still deeply shaken by the memory of the murder of his wife, Sharon Tate, at the hands of the Charles Manson family, he is back at work outside Cherbourg in France. That's where we found him on location, and that's where he sat down with us and talked on the record for the first time since he fled the United States. Why did you get involved with a 13-year-old? Well, since uh, uh, the girl uh, is anonymous, and I hope, hope for her sake, that she will be. She will be. I would like to uh, uh, describe her to you. She is not uh, a child. She is a young woman. She had uh, and testified uh, to it previous uh, sexual experience. She wasn't unschooled in sexual matters. Uh, she was consenting and willing, whatever. Uh, I did was wrong. I think I paid for it. I went through a year of uh, incredible hardship and uh, I think I paid for it. Hollywood producer Andrew Brownsburg, a longtime friend of Polanski. It's something that can happen to a lot of people, especially a prominent film director in Beverly Hills. These are the kind of things that happen quite frequently. We spoke to another close friend of Polanski's, Polish-born novelist Jerzy Kuczynski. One gets the impression from what one reads about him that he's a man involved in orgy and drug-taking and self-love and hedonism and self-indulgence. Is he that man? <laughs> I think he's absolutely insa insane. Take a look at Polanski. And I don't ask me, don't read the press, see him. <laughs> A country lane in Normandy on France's northern coast. It was here a few weeks ago that we watched Roman Polanski at work, directing the opening scenes of a film based on Thomas Hardy's novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. A tale of prejudice and tragic love set in 19th century England. Polanski is an exacting, meticulous director. We met on this self-same road the other night. And I said goodnight. At one moment he works to perfect the timing of an actor's lines. Uh, begging your pardon, sir. He stopped. We met on the same, self same road the other day. And did so again tonight. So I did. After each time, you know, I want this sort of... He, he has to think it over, though. You know, it's something new and... Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. Later, he has his star, Nastasia Kinski, do push-ups, so her arms will really tremble in a dramatic scene. And one more again. Isn't it? No, I can't. The last one, the last one. Oh, the last one. Polanski himself has mastered almost every facet of his trade, from acting in his own films to operating his own camera. Okay, now this is fine. Polanski was the son of Polish Jews who were confined in concentration camps during World War II. His mother perished, his father survived. Polanski himself managed to find precarious shelter with peasant families in the Polish countryside. Since his childhood, Polanski has been drawn to the world of film. And when he was only 29, in Poland, his first major film, Knife in the Water, won him kudos in the West. But he was more interested, he says, in making films than money. But we never thought of money at that time. We, we didn't think we want to make films because we want to be rich. We wanted to make films because we loved what we were doing. He made films that enhanced his reputation, like Repulsion, which he made in England. The portrait of a woman played by Catherine Deneuve as she descended into homicidal insanity. <laughs> Then he embarked upon a chilling black comedy, The Fearless Vampire Killers. She needs blood. With Polanski himself playing the lead, succumbing in the end to one of the vampires played by a young actress by the name of Sharon Tate. 
my little hand, my pretty hand. Soon I will be sleeping. <laughs> In real life as well, Polanski succumbed to Sharon Tate. He married her in 1968. That same year, he directed Mia Farrow in Rosemary's Baby, the harrowing account of a young woman forced to give birth to the son of Satan. No! It can't be! No! Professionally, Polanski was at the top. He and Sharon were a glamorous and trendy couple with homes in Los Angeles and London. Sharon became pregnant, and Polanski at last seemed to be putting down roots. And I remember that during that period, when I was in London, I remember an instant when I was thinking, I'm happy now. I really am happy, and I don't want anything else. Then came the night of August 9, 1969, when Sharon, eight months pregnant, and four other people were brutally cut down at Polanski's rented home in Los Angeles. Their murderers, it later turned out, were bizarre cult leader Charles Manson and two of his followers. Polanski at the time was finishing a movie script in London. You were reported to be willing to pay top dollar to have Charles Manson killed. I want him dead, you are reported to have said. Untrue? When uh, the whole tragedy happened, I was running and trying to help the police and uh, doing all kinds of things to find those culprits. There was this irrational anger. If I could have them, I would kill them. But when they were found, I just uh, felt no uh, belligerence towards them. I just felt nothing. I just uh, don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't care what happens to them. That's not going to change anything. She's gone. It has been said the victims, the friends who were murdered along with Sharon, were assassinated twice, once by the murderers, a second time by the press. Absolutely. The articles that appeared after that tragedy were so abominable. They were framed in such a way to make it seem that Roman was responsible for his own wife's murder. There were so many stories about, about kinky sex and about drug taking and about self-indulgence and about what kind of a life did you people lead? Was, was there any... Well, you, look, Mike, I'm not criticizing you for it. You try to make, the, to, to put your questions the way that the audience will uh, for a moment stop eating and start listening to you. And no. what will remain in their mind is this headline that you just said and quoted and the headline that I have read many, many times and not what I'm going to answer to you because if I tell you that we left, lived quietly, that we had quiet evenings and listened to the music, that, uh, that Sharon was a lovely cook, it will all seem like alibiing and uh, uh, will serve no purpose no, because the very fact that you have to ask these questions put me, puts me already in bed light because if you ask someone a question, is it true that you had an intercourse with a zebra in the middle of Trafalgar Square, it puts him in bad light, whether he, even if he says, are you completely crazy or are you joking, whatever he will say, there will be in the memory of people this question, that he was asked whether he had an intercourse with a zebra. Look, your good friend, Andrew Bronsberg, told me, he said, the spark went out of Roman when Sharon was killed. I mean, all that happened is that after many years, he managed to learn how to live and seem to function in a viable manner to other people. But he hasn't recovered from that. Well, you know, I don't like to talk about those things, but there's a lot of truth in it. And the spark is still not there, Roman? I thought it would be very difficult to find a woman like Sharon. And so far, I wasn't able yet to find anybody or uh, develop this type of relationship with any woman. Uh, I think that uh, uh, that uh, time of happiness was a blessing of some sort, and uh, I should content myself with it, and I think it's very difficult to ask too much. What manner of man is Polanski? We asked his friend, novelist Jerzy Kaczynski. You will, see, you will see a very restless man. You will see a man who's a sportsman. Uh, you will see a man who is full of uh, enormous energy, philosophically minded. He reads a lot. 
He likes pleasure, of course. He likes going out to dinner with his friends. Or <laughs> <laughs> other things. He is probably um, um, vain. He likes women. To be seen with, yes. He's a filmmaker after all, he's a glamorous man. Um, um, he's not different than most of us. He likes to be surrounded by women and he likes to be surrounded by younger women where adoration shows more easily. And he loves to work, probably above all. It was not for many months after Sharon Tate's death that Polanski went back to work. His first film, a terrifyingly grisly version of Shakespeare's Macbeth. And then Chinatown, starring Jack Nicholson as a Los Angeles private eye, with Polanski himself playing the role of a vicious punk. Hello, Claude. Where'd you get the midget? You're a very nosy fellow, kitty cat, huh? You know what happens to nosy fellows? Huh? No? Wanna guess? Huh? No? Okay. They lose their noses. <laughs> Oh. Next time you lose the whole thing. Cut it off and feed it to my goldfish. I think that indeed some of my films have scenes of violence, like all our culture, because we, 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 uh, we are brought up on violence. Violence is part of human life, and my films reflect life. And uh, uh, maybe I do it with uh, more detail, with more authenticity than other directors, and for that reason, it may be more repellent, but I think that violence should be repellent. I see nothing attractive in violence. Themes of despair. Yes, there is a lot of that in my pictures. Wow. There is a theme of despair. Uh, I don't think that I have a, a particular reason for uh, thinking otherwise. Indeed, I had heard that Polanski had said recently that if given the chance to relive his life, he would not. Did you really say that? Oh, yes, I think so. I wouldn't go through everything once again. I would not. Which brings us back to March 1977 and the latest unhappy, bizarre turn in Polanski's life. Arrested and hauled into a Los Angeles court, and finally, as we have said, pleading guilty to having had unlawful sexual intercourse with a 13-year-old girl. Polanski was facing Los Angeles Judge Lawrence Rittenband, who was not reluctant to talk about the case to reporters. Rittenband finally ordered Polanski to undergo a psychiatric examination at the California Men's Prison at Chino. I spent those 42 tough days there, hoping that finally I'm uh, going over that abominable period of my life and nobody, nobody amongst the, uh, the prison authority, the prisoners, the, the guards would believe that I would ever, there was a remote possibility of me coming back. The prison experts concluded that Polanski was not mentally ill. They recommended no further stay in prison. But Judge Rittenband indicated he would order Polanski back to prison for at least several weeks, possibly more, if Polanski would not voluntarily agree to leave the country. Before the judge could pass sentence, Polanski fled to Paris. You ran away, <clears throat> Roman. You ran away. Well, I, as you say, ran away because I think that I was very unfortunate to have a judge who uh, uh, misused justice. And he was playing with me for a period of a year. It was a year of anxiety, a year of uh, drama for me. It was a year which uh, exhausted whatever finances I had. And I thought that was simply enough. Enough is enough. And that was my decision to leave. To go back to the United States, now, what would have to happen? Well, first of all, I would have to know what I'm facing when I go to the United States. As I, uh, I have proved before, I'm not afraid of uh, going to prison. Uh, no, it's not true. I was afraid of going to prison. I just I would not uh, say no for going to prison uh, as long as I know where I stand. 
as long as I don't become again some kind of mouse uh, with which some abominable cat begins uh, a sport. Judge Rittenband, who has now disqualified himself from the case, declined to speak about Polanski, but Steve Trott, Chief Deputy DA of Los Angeles County, says that if Polanski were to return voluntarily to California, he would face the possibility of up to a year in custody, minus the time he has already served. Or, says Trott, the new judge could simply put Polanski on probation.